Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So on All Things LGBTQ, we have been promoting an upcoming presentation sponsored by the Duxbury Historical Society for Pride Day. And this is the presentation. The Mob and Stonewall, Unraveling the Mafia's Influence in the 1969 Uprising. Do I have your interest? Perspective we haven't discussed before? The person who's going to be doing the presentation is Alex Hortis, and this is Alex's bio. Alex Hortis is a crime historian and lawyer. His first book, The Mob in the City, was the first nonfiction history of the mafia to prominently feature the mob's role in gay nightlife. He's spoken on this subject at the New York City LGBT Center, at the Mob Museum in Los Angeles. His newly released second book, The Witch of New York, is about the first woman put on trial for capital murder in a tabloid media circus. Now that does sound familiar. So welcome, Alex. Thank you for having me. I and Thank you for coming to Vermont to share this piece of history that I don't think I've ever seen anyone else talk about. So how is it that you, as an attorney, became interested in investigating and writing about organized crime and the mafia? So when I was in law school at NYU, I took almost on a whim, a summer research job with Jim Jacobs, who was one of the leading um, academic scholars on the mafia. And so as part of that, um, I got to research how the New York mafia actually existed. Like most Americans, I was fascinated by the movies, but I wasn't quite sure it was real, if that makes sense. But then when I, we actually started researching the prosecutions and the wiretaps and all the other matters, it came alive to me. Um, so I had thought for a long time about writing an earlier book, kind of a prequel to the book that I worked on, on the rise of the New York Mafia. Um, and when I was researching this, one, a key idea behind it is, is that the mob moves into all things illegal um, that have a popular demand, um, almost by definition. It's what they, they do. And so people hadn't really thought um, too much. Um, Martin Duberman had written on Stonewall and the mob connection. Um, and there had been a, a couple of others, but you know, kind of integrating that with the mafia itself, it was just another source of revenues because during the 20th century, um, going back before then, you know, it was effectively illegal to be gay, but places um, like cities, of course, had very large closeted gay populations. Um, and so there was this huge demand. And then what converged with that is a little bit of personal history. So my aunt was uh, Karen Thompson and she was um, married to Sharon Kowalski. I could see your expression. And I knew them growing, growing up. They were actually lived as roommate, quote, roommates in our basement. And then after the terrible accident, uh, Sharon was hit by a drunk driver and severely injured. Karen was unable to see Sharon for years because her parents just denied the relationship. So I got in a, you know, and it was the eighties in Minnesota, you know, it was an unusual early education and to me, with you know, fairness, really. Um, I, I didn't even view it as so much as a cause. I was just a kid because um, I knew them both and I couldn't figure, couldn't understand why they weren't allowed to see each other. Um, and then another connection closer to Vermont, um, you know, my 
my uncle, Greg Trollson, um, I knew him going back, you know, to the, to the 80s as well. Um, I gradually learned over time uh, that he had a partner and I saw how much, you know, that he had done and to, to fight for equal rights in Vermont. And he, and you, and many people in Vermont led the way. And so because of that personal angle converging like with this historical angle, it was a perfect topic because a lot of, you know, none of the other mainstream histories on the mafia like talked about this. It was, they both sides were a little embarrassed by it, right? So like the kind of mafia writers, it was, what is this? You know, it's like not quote macho or something. But then a lot of the gay community were not, you know, proud of, proud of this at the time. You know, it was the source of pain and embarrassment. So I thought I'm going to write about it. I just says, I'm going to write about it, integrate it into the book as if it was just an, another illegal enterprise and the reason for it. And and you gave me a bit of a teaser before we started taping. So I, I want to sort of circle back to it right now, which is when you were writing this book or when you were approaching this subject, did you approach it from the perspective of writing about organized crime in the mafia in New York City, and that led you into Stonewall? Or was it you were looking at Stonewall and all of a sudden the mafia connections started showing up? Now, I would say, well, I had read the book on, you know, by Martin Doomer on Stonewall, so I knew the mafia connection even before I started working on the book. But I really, it was really more uh, perspective of writing the mafia book. And I just decided... I'm not going to exclude this. This is really interesting, and there is, I view it as a, as a little bit of a part of, of gay rights history. So I wasn't going to exclude it, like you know others had done. So, in in the presentation that you shared with me that you did at the Pratt Library, you talked about how our perception of gay life in New York is inaccurate and distorted that up until 1930, or the 1930s, gay life in New York pretty much rivaled that as what we had seen in Berlin prior to the rise of the Nazi party, where it was very public, it was very active, people talked about it. Could you share a little bit about that piece of our history? And then I, you've alluded to it already, but and then what happened in the 1930s that things started shifting and the mafia and the gay community started developing its unique relationship? So, so I had read um, Gay New York by uh, you know, George Chauncey and this is his great insight is that we assume you know, the, the closet was forever. Like the closet you know, had gone back forever and his he had shown, and I everything that I had researched had confirmed it, is that it's more like this. It, you know, the history of, of tolerance. And it wasn't, you know, it was not like today. I don't want to, you know, say that. It was still very difficult to be gay or transgender in, you know, 1910s or 20s. But there was a very visible and large, open um, gay entertainment society within New York City. And... It was, you know, at times would rival Berlin, which of course, you know, everyone who's seen Cabaret was was the great gay center of the world at the time. People all, often were, didn't know that either. And so what happens, is, because it was viewed differently, it wasn't viewed as this very strict binary straight or gay. It was essentially assumed everybody could have the capacity for some quote buggery. And it wasn't just because you engaged in, you know, same-sex activities, it didn't make you, quote, queer, necessarily. So there was quite a, a bit of it. It was a bachelor society. It was way more men than women in a lot of these communities, particularly Italian communities. Sometimes it surprises people, but the same um, sex um, activity among Italians was, was higher than any other ethnic group, very high. Um, and so there were, there was a lot of same-sex activity. There were open events. There were drag balls in Webster Hall in New York. That There were photos taken of it. And so it was actually roughly tolerated. I don't want to say it's the same, but it was roughly tolerated. It was better to be gay in the 1920s than it was to be gay in the 1950s. And what you had shared in your presentation is that during that time, gay men were actually viewed as being 
a third sex. You know, we were outside of the traditional binary so that someone say, you know, an, an Italian immigrant who would come to New York to raise money to bring the rest of their family being engaged in a same sex relationship was not dishonoring their family. No, it, it, it wasn't viewed as it, quite as that. It was, you know, it was just a physical activity in a sense. Now, I suspect that there were more than more than a few who did have feelings, you know, and there were, we know that in retrospect, but it wasn't viewed as one same sex activity and all of a sudden you're part of that third sex, you know, that, that, that was not how, you have to very, you know, very assertively identify essentially as that third sex really to be viewed as such. Okay, so the 1930s, things change and as part of your presentation at Pratt, it was prohibition happened. And all of a sudden, alcohol becomes illegal, which, as you've already alluded to, moves it right into, you know, the traditional venue for organized crime. Exactly. So alcohol remain, is illegal, but very remains very popular with the high demand. So almost like an axiom then, the mob comes in and services that illegal market and they need, you know, you need muscle essentially and violence to control the routes, to smuggle in the booze, to finance the, you know, getting in the booze, including I might add, you know, through Vermont, like the booze was coming in through, through Vermont because Canada and, and the UK still had a lot of booze and they were smuggling in the good booze. And so they were smuggling in through the Canadian border um, gay life gets swept up like anyone else in, in the mob run bars of prohibition. Um, and so there are gay bars. The earliest one I could find with a mob connection was the 1890s, but it really flourished in the 1920s. And so there were just a lot of shows, what we would now call drag shows that would make like the New Yorker and things that there were, there were celebrities, uh, you know, Gene Malin, um, you know, did this drag show right at this speakeasy, right in the middle of Times Square. Um, and so the mob looked at this and said, this is a big market. Their money's as good as, as anyone's. And so like, we're gonna service this market because we can pay off the police. Like we know how to pay off the police for everything else. So we can pay off the police for this as well. And, and it was during the 1930s that New York and, and other places started enacting or passing legislation, policies, stat, um, municipal statutes that were anti-gay. So yeah, that- I, Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, so that gets folded in. Why all of a sudden with prohibition and then prohibition ending, do you think that we became part of a subject of interest as well? Great question. There's not one, you know, settled answer. Um, historians are still debating that. What is with this backlash in the 1930s? You know, like what happens? Part of it was the quote excesses of the 1920s. It was seen as there were just too much, you know, public sex. And, um, and so there were, it got, kind of got swept in with that. There was a Hayes code on movies. There was this backlash. There is some theory, you know, some people have argued it had something to do with the Great Depression because like there's a lot of unemployed men and somehow, you know, this was viewed as sort of a challenge to their masculinity. But the key part for why what happens becomes gay prohibition specifically, and I, that's a term I like to use is gay prohibition, is there are these liquor boards that are set up because they repealed prohibition, but they didn't want to go back to like the olden days, the drunken saloons, because there were a lot of problems with drinking. And so they have really heavily regulated liquor boards where the police would enforce it. But the problem with that, of course, is once you have, uh, anybody who's ever run a restaurant or a bar knows that you lose your liquor license and it's like a death sentence for that establishment. So it gave great sway to the police and to these liquor board agents to basically extort anyone um, who violated or even could be said to violate 
And they started passing was disorderly conduct laws um, in, and disorderly conduct regulations that basically said to be gay would be is to be disorderly. Um, so simply having gay patrons in your bar, if they could tell, a lot of times, you know, of course they couldn't tell or they guessed wrong or whatever, but but if they had, you know, what they viewed as stereotypical gay people in a bar, um, that was, a, a, you know, could be a threat to their liquor license. Um, and so they started cracking down and you could see like these liquor board reports and they're fascinating. Like they say, you know, I went into a bar, saw somebody who, you know, was dressed, you know, like a woman or, you know, something like that, or very effeminate, you know, I questioned them, they hit on me. And so I arrested them and shut, you know, trying to shut down the bar. Um, and so gay prohibition starts in the 1930s, basically the entire power of the state comes crashing down on gay people. So, you know, it's, it, it becomes illegal essentially to be gay in public. It becomes, you know, they can't show them anymore on screen before the 1930s, there were a lot yeah. of gay images. I'm sure you've, you know, you see the celluloid closet. There's a lot of images. But then with the Hayes Code that comes in, there's a censorship, but they still, these clever filmmakers still get references in, still get innuendo in. But it goes all the way down to, you know, liquor board, police, you could lose your job if you were out it. Um, it's like the entire power of the state comes crashing down on gay people. So this is what we know as the severe closet that older gay men still remember and women still remember. Um, yeah. And you had, in your presentation, you had shared that there was a very unique relationship between the mafia, the police and bar raids in that usually the police, because they were being paid off, you know, they, they had to go in and occasionally do a raid on the bar just for public image. You know, just to say, oh, yes, we're doing our job. You know, we're we're keeping track of this stuff. Don't worry. And traditionally, the police would let the bar know beforehand or would let the mafia know beforehand who would notify the bar so they could close the till and get people out. But that, and this is where you give a different perspective on Stonewall that that's not necessarily what happened that night. Yeah, yeah, and I would say it was a you know it was an illegal system, so it was very haphazard. There were still plenty of raids that would sweep up um, gay people, um, and we don't know exactly why. Sometimes the mob would tip them off. Some of them would just sacrifice them. Sort of, you know, their, their patrons would sacrifice them. I and one thing that I always resist is you know romanticizing. You know, the mob's treatment of gay people in this period. Although there's some that will swear, or some, you know, that they were very good patron, you know, very good bar owners are very kind to them, which I don't, you know, question. But um, but they but what happened with Stonewall was for whatever reason they had made the payoff and it was a full night, it was very busy. Um, but for whatever reason they came another time. He later said because they were trying to raid, you know, Officer Pine, because they were really going after the mafia. He knew that there was the mafia behind this, which he was not wrong about. Um, and so he he said at least some people have accepted this, other have have not. I you know I I do think that it was very well known that the Genovese family ran this you know the Stonewall, and so I think that there is something to it. Um, and so they raided it, and people got really mad like extremely mad and we don't know why they have these inflection points but for whatever reason that was just going to be like the last night that they were going to take this raid you know these humiliating raids where they're like rounded up sometimes they take a photo sometimes they list their names in the newspaper they lose their jobs some of them had families and wives um and so for whatever reason we don't know why it was just a, a warm summer night and they just decided this was this was not going to happen tonight and they fought back this time. In your presentation, you also said that one of the aspects of this raid that was slightly different was that they asked the patrons to produce identification, which is something that traditionally they hadn't asked. So that from what you were just saying, you know, the risk of disclosure just got heightened. It just got heightened. It was very, um, yeah, it was it not only you know it was not only insulting; it was dangerous. 
um, to be to be outed. And it was really interesting too because the most aggressive opponents were the drag queens. And it may have been, to some extent, they had nothing left to lose at that point. Um, and they were they were the most you know aggressive along the front lines of the of the rebellion. Um, they pushed the police all the way back into the bar. And Pine, who had served in Korean War, said he had never been that frightened before um, because there was all the shouting and screaming, and there's just and you know it was a huge mob. I mean, you know, thousands of people eventually, you know, come you know come around this bar, and they were afraid. <laughs> Well, what was going to happen? It was not, you know, really crazy out of control. Like, no, you know, things weren't burnt. It wasn't, you know, they weren't out to like destroy things, but they were definitely there to not leave. They were not going to leave that night. So they start singing songs. They start dancing. It becomes a celebration. Um, and they basically push back, you know, the police manage to escape out of there. And they basically lose the, they lose the bar. They lose the Stonewall that night. You know, the police lose that night, you know. Um, and, and the media really didn't write a whole lot or give a whole lot of attention to what happened until very much after the fact. Yes, and this is a fascinating story about how gay and lesbian people have made their own history in a lot of ways, is that when it first happened, the Village Voice even kind of ridiculed it, you know, the famous liberal Village Voice ridiculed it, um, you know, made jokes, you know, gay jokes about it. Um, it was not a huge news event in, you know, there were a lot of protests and, and riots going on in New York in the, in the late 60s, you know, and early, so, you know, so this was not a crazy, you know, unexpected, completely unexpected event, except for who was involved. Um, and so at the time, no, it could have faded into obscurity, but then there's a very interesting sequel that happens with it with it um which is which is there were some very um savvy organizers named like craig rodwell and others who are on the ground actually had the honor of speaking to some of them at, at the mob museum this this gentleman came up and he told me that in the days after the stonewall he was part of the organizing efforts and he was way out in queens you know he was like way out in yeah, and so like they were everywhere. And so they said, we're gonna make this this different. We're gonna commemorate this. And we're gonna set up, a, you know, we're gonna set up these committees. The Mattachine Society was originally, you know, a little reluctant. They came on, they did eventually come on board. Um, some of the more radical groups kind of sprung up, you know, and they said, we're gonna commemorate this. So they, they had this like list uh, you know, demands, and I, I've been researching this across the country, and what I've seen is, people have forgotten about this, but one of it is get the mob out of the bars. Like, like people forget about that, but they, you know, the police, you know, that system was was dreadful for gay people. It, you know, it was awful, you know, high price, watered down booze, like they had to do the raids. Um, and so one of their demands, and I think it was very brave, in a sense, they were also taking on the mob here um, and the police. Um, and just society in general. And so they organized the first gay pride parade. Um, and that becomes the precedent then. There had been other riots before in Los Angeles. There have been smaller ones, but they were forgotten, you know, um, because they were, it, it wasn't followed up. This was followed up. And so they said, we're, gonna, we're coming out now. And, and it was you know, such a, a valuable lesson on visibility. It was ultimately, we will never, you know, and, and certainly as you'd alluded to before, you know, it was not by far not the majority of gay people, but it was the, it was a small subset that said, we will not be invisible anymore. Visibility, you know, the closet is the enemy. The closet is the problem. And we can, all, you know, until all of our relatives and people know, we will always be second class citizens. And so they had this germ of idea that we are going to commemorate this. And they had this pride, pride parade. And then they continued ever since. And then it spread across the country. And so the reason we have pride parades today is because of those savvy organizers after Stonewall. So a sort of cornerstone of our political history was actually the gay community being a commodity for both the mafia and the New York City police 
And we may not have been the intended object that resulted in what we lovingly refer to as the Stonewall Riots. So with that, I need to say thank you for sharing this time with us. And I didn't get to one of the questions, so people are going to have to come on June 19th to sure. the Congregational Church to hear about Vermont's connections to activities of crime syndicates. I think you alluded to it with the you know, Smuggler's Notch is not named that for no reason. No. So thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you. It was a real honor. I appreciate those excellent questions, Keith. Thank you. At this time, I'm sure that our guest today really doesn't need an introduction. Ke Kel is back <laughs> to tell us about year three of Central Vermont Pride. Can you believe this is year three already? So welcome, Cal. Hi, Keith. And we're technically Montpelier Pride, um, but we do stuff in collaboration with Barry and in East Montpelier. We're not like rigid about it, but. Well, I was going to say the, the listing of events and everything you sent me sent Central Vermont Pride. So I thought you were just being oh. expansive and inclusive so there okay so th this year is an incredibly expanded offering and it starts on wednesday may 29th and it runs through tuesday june 18th yeah that's a lot of that's that's many days and nice. many events so could you start by telling us what you think are some of the highlights for this year or the new events that people really don't want to miss? Totally. I think one of the biggest changes is that to offset from Essex Pride, which started last year, we moved our Montpelier Fest to Friday night. And I always had curiosity about a Friday evening fest for us because a lot of locals are gone on the weekend. So to be able to roll right out of school after work, come into the fest, on a Friday evening, I think is gonna give us a new flavor. We're gonna have a nighttime parade of lights to end the fest. And then this year, we also really wanted to boost our um, values aligned businesses downtown post the impact of the flood and to keep creating a sustainable model for Montpelier. So we have a couple of fundraisers that will be baked in. Um, the Queer Musician Showcase at Three Penny on Thursday the 30th is also going to have a Pride Eats event. So folks that buy food that night, a percentage of the sales will come back to help funding Montpelier Pride. Um, Capital Cannabis is doing a pre-roll with Pride donation like they did for flood relief. So bringing back in some business uh, having the Savoy on deck again, we've got six films with them that are playing. The whole film fest day is going to be so fun. I love But I'm a Cheerleader, and we're going to do it as a dress-up party this year. Uh, I'm already getting my cheerleader look ready. And uh, we're going to be showing Break the Game is going to close the fest on that Sunday. It's a documentary that just came out and played Tribeca. So the moment that we could bring it into the Pride Fest was a really good one. It's about a trans game runner, Narcissa, who is a world record holder for Zelda. So it's a beautiful documentary. There's some mature content. There's some hard, harmful content. But overall, it's an excellent film. And Tilly Walden, the uh, Vermont comic artist, we always try to get Kellogg Hubbard in as a hosting venue because I love the library. I use them as the bike ride meetup spot, but we're not technically inside. But Tilly Walden joined the Vermont Humanities Council Speakers Bureau this year. So I was able to bring Tilly in for a queerness and comics talk during the week, which will be a fun all ages. I'm always like, where can we have stuff that's all ages friendly, like the Saturday bike ride? Some of the films definitely are youth friendly and the Tilly Walden speak are gonna be really fun art-based events. Charlie O's is back open. So we're gonna kick off with a drag show with Red Rum and Sasha Shiracha and Lucy Fur Matrix. So that'll be a fun, Back to some and, of our favorites. 
I was going to say, and that's uh, that's the event that kicks this all off on Wednesday, May 29th at eight o'clock. And I see on the advertisement, it says tip your performers. Yes, Charlie O's is a, a free entry venue. So it's a great way to support the performers to tip them. And Charlie O's is a cash bar. So you're going to get cash back from your drink and give it to those queens. Okay, let's circle back and, and start talking about some of these events in greater detail. You're talking about the fest on the State House lawn on Friday, May 31st. This is what people are used to for the festival with booze and events and things with which they can participate. And that starts at four o'clock? Yep, it's four to seven on the State House lawn. We'll have acupuncture by donation. We'll have a bunch of local resource tablers that may have resources, um, connections for the community. We'll have a couple of different affinity spaces for people with disabilities and also for people of color to have some space that's curated and separate from the crowd to be with each other. We'll have the big tent back again. It's screen printed with maidenhair ferns. So for me, that is a nice um, nod back to Fern Feather, who was such a staple of Montpelier community that with our Pride Fest, we always want to remember the genocide in Palestine and Congo and Rwanda, the loss of trans lives, and that we're losing a lot of magical people all the time. So coming together both in rage and in joy. We're going to have a dance showcase at the fest this year with the Rivers Way Movement Studio. They're doing an after party show at eight, but their venue doesn't have an elevator. So we're bringing a bunch of dancers out to the State House lawn. We'll have a DJ. Um, Brass Balligan's going to come and play a short set at the end of the fest to help lead us into the parade. And actually, before four o'clock, from 2 30 to 4, the youth are going to do a uh, downtown arts takeover. Toussaint Saint Negritude and Aaron Marcus are going to join them for some poetry on the streets. We're going to give them chalk and autonomy <laughs> and let them run wild and bring a little downtown vibe. Rebel Heart's going to be the hosting site for that little, like, get a little buzz going downtown. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, we'll now parade the, it. the parade is going to start at the State House and go where? We'll we'll circle back to the State House. So we'll okay. gather at the top of the steps, go down Court to School Street, come yep. down Main Street, back around State Street and back into the State House lawn. So I'm going to um, jazz up the youth and let them know like, this is our parade route. Like you can be making messages and creating visibility that then we're going to walk by. Providence does this nighttime parade version. And I thought that would be really cool for us. Like it's a little bit lower traffic that time of night having, um, it'll be shady. So having all your lights and glitz, I'll have all the big flags so we can. Oh, yes. 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 All right. So could you talk a little bit about the films that are mm -hmm. going to be shown throughout? There, There is a group of films that is going to be part of a queer film festival at the Savoy, and, and that's on Sunday the 2nd. Yep. Sunday and then, and then follow, that following Thursday on June 6th is before Stonewall, and then on Tuesday the 18th is Everybody. Could you talk a little bit about the films that are in each of those categories? Yeah, totally. So the Sunday, June 2nd, we'll start at 11 a.m. with Mavian Rose, which is one of my most favorite films about a young person who is gender fluid. And for me, such a special part of that movie is the grandparent connection and the way that the grandmother is so supportive of the little through the film. It's very magical and whimsical. Outright is sponsoring that film. The one thirty showing will be, but I'm a cheerleader. That's the dress up party. Natasha Leone and Clea Duval and RuPaul. It's just so campy and fun. Then we'll have a four o'clock Little Richard. I am everything showing, which if folks haven't seen that documentary, it's incroyable. It's very beautifully done. It chronicles Little Richard's life and career, how he was so inspiring and also unacknowledged in the work. 
He grew up in 1930s, queer and trans, black rock and roll in the South. And I did not know that Tutti Frutti was about butt sex. I loved that. <laughs> it's like Little Richard. And it talks about religion in a way that he has gone in and out of the closet and came from a religious family. So there's content in this film that we don't always see intersectioned in a film. And then the 630, sh and that one's um, Salam Black Walnut is sponsoring Little Richard. And then Break the Game at 630, um, Narcissa Wright's story that is fresh off the press, being a trans person who transitioned, who is very well known, and the harm that they experienced coming back into the gaming world as a trans person, and also the finding of community and where support did come from. and family relationships and relationships with our computer as a way to build community. There's a lot of layers to the film. The Savoy is also going to open up the downstairs that day so that we can have just a hub for folks to hang out before or after films, get some resources, just like have some space to be. And then Thursday before Stonewall is sponsored by Berry Pride, Keith and Chris Hunt are going to lead a little post discussion. A couple of the films will have like a little 20 minute or so discussion after the film before Stonewall has some really great content. And it's very outdated in terms of the intersectional lens of how our movement began. It's uh, very much based around people of privilege with white skin and cisgender identities. So I, I know we're going to have a lot to talk about after that film. And it's a good, it's a 1984 documentary. And then everybody at the end of the month, we wanted to stretch out the fast so that there was a lot during that Pride Week between Barry and Montpelier, but then to have one at the end of the month, James and I have been talking about bringing the Everybody Intersex documentary that came out a couple of years ago. It's very excellent and talks about the intersections of trans and intersex healthcare. There's three individuals that follows through advocacy, through personal story. There's a lot we're not doing in Vermont to lift up intersex folks. We did get the intersex inclusive pride flags this year. So you'll see those flying around Montpelier. It's the yellow with the purple circle that you see in the flags. We'll reprint the stickers. So that will be updated too. And Aaron Marcus and I are going to lead a little discussion after that one around where are we at with healthcare? What could we be doing? Where do we need legislative advocacy? From what I hear from Taylor, Vermont's not talking about having intersex as an option on birth certificates, period, that we're talking about having X be that placeholder. I don't know that that's the right conversation. I think if we're going to talk about one, why not two gender markers? Seems like a good opportunity. We don't want to do more testing on babies or over clinicalize babies. And also people should have that choice to have intersex on a birth certificate, either before or after birth. Um, right now it's MF, O for other or X for unknown unspecified. And you can get that after birth, the right. X very hard initially. So I'm excited for that conversation with everybody. I train a lot of healthcare providers and there's at least one in 650 babies are in, on the intersex spectrum. There's over 22. A lot of them are uh, syndromes that we're just medicalizing. Nature's beauty is, it's really infuriating. Yeah. I, I was going to say, it's a conversation that I had tried starting it several times and really couldn't, couldn't how I couldn't get it defined so that people could, could talk about it. Okay, now you're also adding in on June 9th in, at the old labor hall, a political teaching and networking. What's the idea behind this? Yeah, we when we first started Montpelier Pride a couple of years ago, one of the immediate asks um, I got from a couple of folks is, what about politicians participating? What about like a political conversation, space, event, something? And I was like, you know, this is really community-based. Let's see what blooms up. And what happened was like Mike Pichak and other folks came out to the bike rides. They were in the streets. They were participating at events as um, political people. And that felt better to me than them like having a table or 
being on the mic talking. So this year, Ella act up. I'm going to bring a teach in. The old labor hall does these monthly themed political sort of strategy sessions, and they're collaborating with us for the June one to be focused on uh, 2ST, LGBTQ plus community, two-spirit, transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual plus. And the ACLU is going to do a legislative advocacy, like a mini 45-minute session. The Free Her campaign is going to do one on where the women's prison conversation and decarceration alternatives conversations at. Um, two Isaacs are going to do one on how to run a political campaign. So for folks that want to run for office, whatever that office is, get some questions answered and have some time and space to strategize and dialogue. And the Worker Center is going to do one on grassroots campaigns. So it's a nice mix of some of our priority players. And I've been framing it with like, what's the difference between me going to the Pride Festa table as an org or to be at like more of a curated space, that Sunday the 9th, we're going to be talking, giving space to having dialogue and conversation and teach backs and information specifically about political advocacy, strategizing, where can we bring people power? Where are we doing okay politically, but could do more liaisoning? I hope that some of our elected reps come out to that. Um, I hope we get a wide range of participants that want to get into conversation and then having some of our really great orgs out here doing work, just bringing them out to bring the information to folks and have it be a little bit more curated to our community. Vermont's doing okay with advocacy at the legislative political level. Uh, Burlington just elected their first woman mayor ever, and she's also a lesbian. We love that. And Becca Ballant being in office, those are big wins for Vermont. And still yet, we have so much work to do. And not all of that work is under the Golden Dome by a politician. So understanding like grassroots movement, migrant justice might be able to join us, but they're doing really great work to get migrant voices heard at a company, Hannaford, who supports our community a lot, but I've been actively boycotting Hannaford as soon as I heard what was happening with their lack of support with migrant justice, boycotting um, in the Palestine movement, that is one way for us to push back with our dollars. And there's lots of strategies. So I'm excited for that as a closer. It's going to be a potluck style. So if folks want to bring food to just chat and chew and connect, the Old Labor Hall is a wonderful hosting venue and has that energy of social anarchy. I I love this. Okay, so it sounds as though Montpelier Central Vermont Pride is going to go nowhere but to continue to grow. And for that, thank you. And with that, I need to thank you for spending your time with us. Yes. And please be sure to give me contact information. So if people want to volunteer to help or be more actively involved in future years, we can do that. And I look forward to repeating this interview. Thanks so much, Keith. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.